The Gull Guide was the most anticipated field guide of 2024. Well, it isn't really a field guide, it's more of a reference, but then why is it this small? I'll get into that in a minute, but I need to start with the fact that this is the best guide for the most challenging group of birds. If you're new to my channel, I'm Doug Hitchcock. My goal is to get the most people to see the most birds, and in this video I'm going to review the Gull Guide and show you what makes it so great. I'll compare it to other Gull references because it turns out this might not be the best book for you. Then I'll end with a couple critiques because while this book is really good, I have some gripes to share after using it for a few weeks. So here it is, The Gull Guide by Amar Ayash. This is a photographic guide to the gulls found in North America, published by Princeton University Press in November 2024. As Princeton's description reads, it's packed with the very latest research on field identification, updated taxonomy, current distribution trends, color maps, and helpful notes on natural history, aging, and molt. If it isn't clear already, what made this book so eagerly anticipated was a perfect pairing of author and topic, one of the foremost experts on gulls in North America writing a gull identification guide. This is a subject we haven't had a worthwhile update on in many years, and I'll compare this to other guides in a bit. I think the best way to describe Amar is that he is your favorite birder's favorite birder. Most birders have encountered Amar via the North American Gulls Facebook group that he has been running for over 12 years and probably helped identify thousands of gulls for people. Amar also runs the gull treasure trove known as anythingloris.com, where you can find monthly quizzes and summaries of notable sightings. I want to share a quick story of the first time I met Amar back in 2011 when the second ABA record of gray-hooded gull was found at Coney Island in New York. This is a pretty amazing record seeing how far from the normal range this individual was and because most of their population is resident within their range. Coney Island made for a pretty cool backdrop for this gull, which happily fit in with the local laughing gulls looking for pure fries and Nathan's hot dogs. I drove down with a few other birders, and I remember while watching the gray hooded gull, seeing another birder studying a separate flock of gulls. I don't remember if I went over because I wasn't sure if they knew where the gray hooded gull was, but it became pretty obvious they were a true lorephile, and they seemed more excited to point out to me the first summer lesser blackback gull. Obviously, that was Amar. Diving into the actual book, I can't emphasize enough how valuable the intro text is. I know how exciting it can be to jump right into species accounts and figure out exactly how to tell European from American herring gulls, but especially if you are fairly new to gulls, you need to start here. Without just reading parts of this book to you, one point I want to make about why this book is so good is probably thanks to Amar's background as a math teacher. Topics and concepts are introduced in a very accessible way that don't overwhelm the reader. As an example, in the discussion on aging gulls and how IDs typically begin with assigning an age to a subject, after explaining there are two, three, and four cycle species, and even acknowledging our own assessments are no more than a crude estimate, that section ends with the acknowledgement that he hadn't even <laughs> defined what a cycle was yet. He front loads information and makes slowly learning it easier than as if trying to just force a whole new language on you at once. The other thing I like about Amar's writing, and perhaps what proves that gulls are both challenging and provide many unanswered questions, is that I counted 112 question marks in the book. Using this book, you'll not only have the tool to identify what you are looking at, but perhaps even come up with your own investigations to pursue while out gulling. The last thing I'll mention about the intro, especially because it covers aspects so underappreciated by birders and especially photographers, is a few pages devoted to nuances, caveats, and pitfalls. I'll actually talk about one of these pitfalls showing up in a different Gull ID book in a minute, but even if you don't plan on buying this book, if you ever see it on a shelf, pull it out and start reading on page 34 and thank me, or actually thank Amar later. All right, let's talk about the meat of this book, the species accounts. As expected, they are incredible. The best way I can think to describe them is that not only is nothing left out, but you will learn something from everyone. I thought I knew most gulling fun facts from all my years as a naturalist, but I honestly learned something new on page one of this book. Species are put into a few intuitive groups, the small turn-like and hooded gulls, the larger loris gulls, and the hybrids. But notably, there is a subsection among the loris to cover the aptly named herring gull complex. There are 47 pages, nearly 10% of the whole book devoted to the three species covered in this complex. Kudos to Amar for breaking these up as he did, since it was just this year that the eBird Clemens taxonomy split herring gull into four species, American herring, European herring, Vega, and Mongolian. The former three of these have been previously recorded in the ABA area and are covered in this section. 
As a side note, the AOS did not accept this split, and the taxonomic waters just get murkier and murkier, at least for now. Anyways, the impressive scale of this book can be seen in the number of photos just in this subsection. There are 89 plates just for American herring gull, 38 plates for European herring gull, and 45 plates for vega gull. After this complex is the account for yellow-legged gull, and that reminds me I want to give a shout out to the Lifeless podcast where Alvaro and George did a great interview with Amar. While they were talking about how the species accounts have really interesting overview section, Amar calls out the account for yellow-legged gull where he did his own analysis of North American records and ends with this banger, quote, it would appear that many of the historic records are in error. One of these is actually a bird that I chased back in 2011. I was in my final year at the University of Maine, and that April, when I should have been studying for finals, a report went out of yellow-legged gull on Cape Cod. My buddy Eric and I made the drive down from Orono and arrived shortly after sunrise. The bird put on a great show. We could see all the diagnostic field marks, the yellow legs, mantle color between herring and lesser blackback, and it flew around letting us take photos of the spread wing showing a pretty perfect primary pattern. The record essentially fell apart as more documentation was collected, notably a recording of the long call, which was more herring gull-like than any known yellow-legged gull. And then, many months later, towards the end of the year, the bird was found again, although this time in basic plumage with a head-streaking pattern that ruled out yellow-legged gull. I just wanted to point out this record because it was one that many birders happily ticked off their lifeless as yellow-legged gull, myself included. But it was thanks to the high-quality documentation, lots of the photos, and especially the audio of the long call, that this was corrected as a putative, lesser blackback American herring gull hybrid. This hybrid pair has been detected much more regularly in the past decade or so, but I do want to make a plug to watch my what to do if you find a rare bird video so you don't ever risk letting a real yellow-legged gull record be lost to a strict state records committee. All right, next up we should see how the gull guide stacks up to the competition. There have been a few good gull guys over the years, and I think it is worth acknowledging a few here because I know I always have that question of like, do I really need another book on gulls? I want to acknowledge that any shortcomings I mention are only meant to come kind of as an objective comparison, not saying that any of these books are bad, because you definitely won't see me taking on the task of writing a gull guide. I'll save some subjective opinions for when I get to my critiques, but anyways, let's start with some of the more popular books on gulls. Perhaps best known for its similarly exhaustive treatment of gulls is the Howell and Dunn Gulls of the Americas that was published as part of the Princeton Reference Guides series in 2007. This book covers 36 species, surprisingly different from the 36 covered in the Gull Guide, but this is mostly because Howell and Dunn included South American species like Andean and Lava Gull. But as mentioned, we've also seen some taxonomic changes in our North American hemisphere gulls too. And it is those changes that is honestly one of the few shortcomings of this book, being almost two decades since it was first published. Amar mentioned in an interview that he had asked Steve Howell if any update was in the works, and it was that knowledge that nothing new was coming that motivated Amar to start work on the Gull Guide in 2018. The book is laid out much like others in the Peterson series, with written species accounts in the back, and for most species only being a page or two long, while plates are located in the front. Similar to the Gull Guide, Gulls of the Americas is overloaded with photos showing all sorts of angles and variation. Along with being a bit out of date, this book's biggest problem is that it has long been out of print and finding copies has been very difficult over the years. You can find reasonably priced copies online now, but there was a time I remember the lowest used price going for around 200 US dollar. If anyone still wants to pay that much, I've got one right here for you. I have to give recognition to Peter Grant's Gulls, A Guide to Identification. The first edition came out in 1982, the second edition followed up in 1986. Acknowledging that most field guides didn't adequately cover gulls, the book was a culmination of five papers originally published in British Birds that focused on the identification of gulls in the western Palearctic, which shows as you look at the list of species covered. Prior to this book, the best treatment of gulls had been Jonathan Dwight's monograph, The Gulls of the World from 1925. While I cannot recommend it at $300, you can download a PDF and still appreciate all the spread wings and tails and the, and the beautiful head and feet plates. And again, that is a funny thing about Grant's gulls, at least from an American perspective, is the grouping of gulls, and particularly the seventh group 
in the back of the book, which covers all the gulls found in Western North America. The photos come up short by modern standards, all being black and white and showing shortcomings of those film days. But why I would still encourage folks to grab a copy off a used bookshelf is for the illustrations that accompany each species account. While most gull books, like the Gull Guide, are full of photographs, these scientific illustrations can put any species in the same pose to illustrate different ages and plumages, which I find immensely helpful and can really only be done by an artist. Along those lines, I have to mention the illustrations by Hans Larsen in the Helm Identification Guides Gulls of Europe, Asia, and North America, written by Klaus Olsen. Again, as someone who really prefers an artist's ability to lay out gulls in the same position and line up a first through fourth cycle for easy comparison, I think this is one of my favorite gull identification books to ever come out. And while the species plates might lack some detail, there are earlier pages covering a comparison of wingtip patterns in large gulls, showing 63 spread wings. This book is also out of print, but used copies aren't too hard to find. And also, while I think it's worth having a copy on your shelf, you can preview it on Google Books and see all those spicy spread wings for free. Amar clearly was a fan of this artwork as well, as Larson's Iceland Gull wingtip plates are also included in the Gull Guide. Olsen also has a newer photographic guide to all of the gulls of the world, which came out in 2018. Unfortunately, that means it missed the newest taxonomic updates, but unless you really want a book of all the gulls in the world, this one comes up a bit short of the coverage that you'll find in the Gull Guide. The last book I want to mention is a slightly newer one, released in 2019, but takes a very different approach to Gull ID, called Gulls Simplified by Pete Dunn and Kevin Carlson. These are two authors that probably don't need any introduction, as they've likely published more articles and essays in addition to Kevin's plethora of photos than most other birders. What is unique here is the approach they took. Unlike most guides that focus on aging gulls and looking at specific feather details, they really lean into the idea of birding by impression. Carlson wrote a whole book on this concept, and that was part of the inspiration for Gull Simplified. I just want to read this one line that I think sums up both the focus of the book and what you'll likely take away from it as well, from page 21 if you're following along at home. About the time Pete decided to write this book, a woman attending one of his regular bird walks asked of a gull standing on the beach, one that he had identified as a lesser blackback gull, whether it was a first or second cycle bird, to which he replied, I have no idea, having no more interest in the bird's age than he did knowing which side of the colony it fledged from or how it voted in the last presidential election. All Pete knew or cared was that it was a certifiable lesser black back gull, a determination made based on size, its lean trim, athletic proportions, its long wings, and its mostly uniform darkest plumage, yada yada yada. Now, I have a feeling that since you're watching a YouTube video about a gull identification book, you probably would have cared if it was a first or second cycle bird. If not, I think Gull Simplified is for you. And not to kick this book while it's down, but one other thing I wanted to mention that I found difficult about the book was the white balance issues throughout. Carlson took most of these photos and you can rarely tell which of his go back decades to his film days. These Iceland gulls really illustrate this problem well, where these three in the top and left were credited to other photographers, but the bottom right photo of Carlson shows a strong blue-green cast to it. And you can find these photos with funny magentas or harsh blown whites throughout. Color issues aren't unique to Gull Simplified. Even the Howell and Dunn book has some pretty color balance challenge photos. But I wanted to point this out mostly to highlight Amar's effort in the Gull Guide to amass a collection of the best photos from dozens of different photographers to best show what he was trying to illustrate. Even choosing to put Ryan Sanderson's stunning black-legged kittiwake over one of his own photos on the cover of his own book is a nod to the selflessness in making this book as best it could be. I do have to share one big gripe I have with this book, and it is actually small. I mean, the book is small, and I guess the gripe is too, given how, how good the book actually is, but I just wish I could appreciate it a bit more with larger images. The book is only about six by eight and a half inches, making it just slightly larger than some of our favorite field guides, but I don't think it's meant to be a field guide. This much densely packed information feels more like a reference, and I'd love to have seen it printed like one. Compared to all the other gull guides I mentioned earlier, it's easily the smallest. And this only matters because that means most plates 
are only measured about two by two and a half inches, and some are even smaller than that. <laughs> Maybe it's just me and my eyes are getting older, but making out the white mirror on this lesser black back gull, or actually appreciating the transition in this Iceland gull subspecies gradient, is really hard to actually see. I will say that despite a couple of these examples, in most cases the specific field mark that Amar mentions in the captions is readily visible, and I'm sure that's not a mistake. Perhaps I'm just used to viewing gull images on the North American Gulls Facebook group where you can easily enlarge and pixel peep, but I would happily pay more for a large format version of the gull guide. If I could make one other request for a second edition, it would be to have more of these quick reference guides. The press release for the book hyped up the one-of-a-kind cheat sheet, and the one page on adult bear park features is super cool, but felt like a little bit more could have been done. Let me be clear, this book is 100% worth getting. I want to encourage everyone to look for it at your locally owned bookshop or nature center. If you go online, Beauty of Books is certainly worthy of your support. Or if you go and order it from Princeton University Press right now and use the code PUP30, you can get it for 30% off. I have no idea how long that will last. I just saw it on one of their Facebook posts and figured you'd appreciate saving a few bucks. As always, thanks for watching. You can help me with my mission of getting the most people to see the most birds by clicking that like, subscribe. I'll see you in the next one.